Welcome back to module number seven, Research Design and Ethics in Psychology. It is quite a short module, so we should get through this rather quickly. The learning targets for this module are to be able to explain the process of determining which research design you should use, um, being able to pick which one makes the most sense for whatever questions you're asking. Also explaining the value of simplified laboratory conditions in illuminating everyday life. Explaining why psychologists study animals and the ethical guidelines that are put in place to safeguard animal research subjects. Uh, describing a very brief introduction to ethical guidelines that safeguard human research participants and understanding a little bit about how the values of a scientist actually affect the psychological science. So how do psychologists decide which research designs to use? Well, the number one thing is to create a testable hypothesis. And by definition, a hypothesis should be a test testable statement. So questions such as, does free will, will exist, isn't really something we can test. But looking at something more like, do free will beliefs influence how people act? Well, you could measure what people's free will beliefs are by coming up with some sort of a survey and then measure some sort of behavioral outcome. So you could have both the, an independent and independent variable to be looking at. Um, or just how, uh, instead of trying to create it as an experiment, you could just create it as a correlational study too, just looking at if someone already has really high free will beliefs, is that related to how they act in a certain, on a certain outcome variable? How do researchers select the best research method? Well, going back to the previous module, um, we have a couple different things we could be looking at uh, as, as scientists. Should we utilize a case study to answer our question about free will? Um, an experiment, like I just said, sometimes it could look like we might want to do an experiment, but we might realize that it's probably more of a, a question that could be answered by a correlational design in combination with some sort of survey. How about naturalistic observation? Is it something we need to collect more information on and go observe whatever the population is that we're interested in? So as a little bit of a review of the basic research methods, descriptive methods basically observe and record behavior, thinking like Jane Goodall, case studies, naturalistic observations, and surveys. Nothing is manipulated. You're basically an observer. No control of variables though, and single cases can be really misleading. You know, having an outlier case that you're actually um, studying can be lead to erroneous conclusions about a population. Correlational studies are, uh, the purpose of them is to detect naturally occurring relationships to assess how well one variable predicts another variable. So in our example that we've been discussing, how, well, how much free will beliefs predict uh, how people act on whatever that would um, measure would be that outcome variable. So you'd be looking at two different variables and seeing how they're related using one of those correlation coefficients we talked about previously. Um, you would, how would you conduct it? You need to collect data on the two variables and you wouldn't manipulate anything but you can't specify cause and effect because as we know, correlation does not equal causation. Now, an experimental method would be put in place to explore cause and effect. You would manipulate one or more factors using random assignment and you'd have to have an independent variable. The independent variable would have to be manipulated. So those in the experimental group would get whatever the um, independent variable was and those in the control group would not. Sometimes it's not feasible. Sometimes it's a lot harder to figure out how to do, but oftentimes it's not feasible or ethical to give uh, one group of people uh, some sort of treatment and withhold it from another group of people. We could think about how this could be the case in many types of medical research, um, but sometimes it's just not feasible to be able to do experimental research. So you have to look at some of the other methods, but then you need to be careful that you cannot um, make the case that one variable causes another variable. So what are the creative steps to research? Just 
generally? What are we thinking about when we're conducting research in psychology? We're going to think about how we're going to design the study, which one of those methods that we're going to use. We're going to measure those target behaviors that we're interested in, and then we're going to interpret the results. So it's just a really basic understanding of what are the creative steps to research. Now, one big issue that we um, often think about within psychology is how is it that we can take the information from a lab experiment and generalize it to everyday life? And this is a, often a problem, right? But it's something that we have to do and we try to do well. So we take something from like a very specific finding that we can actually control in a laboratory environment, like detecting the blink of a faint red light in a dark room, and then we try to understand it very um, in depth. And we try to develop it over time and develop some theoretical principles that could help something like the ability to fly planes at night, help pilots if we understand more about the ability to detect um, the blinking of a faint light, red light in a dark room. So here's a little comprehension check. So the laboratory environment uh, doesn't completely um, mirror what happens obviously in everyday life, but why do we use it? What is the purpose? The laboratory environment is designed for what? Which one of these? Is it designed to exactly recreate the events of everyday life? No. Is it designed to recreate psychological forces under controlled conditions? Yes. So the answer is B. Okay, so this is the controversial subject and I'm sure some of you will come into this class with some um, preconceived belief systems about this and uh, we all have strong values about these types of issues. But why do psychologists study animals? Well, animals are fascinating. <laughs> animals can help us a lot to understand human behavior. And sometimes animals have simpler systems that make it easier for psychologists to look at what might be going on. But what are those ethical guidelines that we should be thinking about if we have animal research subjects? So how, uh, here's a couple or a few different um, of the guidelines. Housing animals under reasonably natural living conditions with companions for social animals. Researchers must provide humane care and healthful con conditions and testing should minimize discomfort. Most universities screen research proposals through an institutional review board and often, all through, often through an animal care ethics committee and laboratories are regulated and inspected. These are all wonderful safeguards that have been put in place over time due to some fairly unethical types of research that have gone on historically. And we're gonna mention a lot of those throughout this class, but it's great that we now have guidelines and um, to safeguard animal research subjects. How have animals benefited from animal research? We know humans have, but psychologists have helped zoos enrich animal environments by reducing the learned helplessness. We're going to talk about that concept from Martin Seligman later on. Um, by reducing the concept of learned helplessness in captivity and giving animals more choices. So psychologists have actually helped um, improve the conditions for animals in many ways in um, places where they're held captive. What ethical guidelines safeguard human research participants? So these are five ideas that are gonna be important to understand and think about as we discuss many different research studies throughout this class. Informed consent, protection from harm, the idea of doing no harm, debriefing, the right of the participants to withdrawal, and confidentiality. So let's discuss the idea of informed consent just to make sure we understand what that means. What is consent? So being asked something like, are you willing to participate in this experiment? This is something that must occur before you can do an experiment um, on, on an individual. You must, even if it's something as simple as a survey, you need to be asking the question, are you a willing participant in this research? Um, and this will actually go through an institutional review board if you're doing research in a university setting and you need to have an in informed consent form for participants to fill out, even if it's something really, really basic. So informed consent. This experiment involves exposure to graphic images that may be disturbing and random bursts of lights that have been known to induce seizures. Are you willing to participate in this experiment? So you can see the difference between basic consent and informed consent. 
Informed consent is more detailed and gives you an idea of what you're actually getting yourself into. And within psychological resource, research, the importance of informed consent cannot be overstated. We need to be letting our participants know to the best extent possible what they're getting themselves into. So what is debriefing? Well, sometimes in some experiments, the true purpose of the study can't be revealed because it would influence the results. So in that, in that case, we would need to use some sorts of deception, deception that would not be harmful, though thinking about that other, that other idea a few slides ago that we can do no harm as research scientists. So if we have to utilize deception afterwards, we need to debrief. When temporary deception is necessary to the research, it must be fully explained at the conclusion of the experiment. We, we must not let our participants leave the research study um, once it ends, not really understanding that whatever was happening was some sort of deception. So a little learning check. Which ethical principle requires that at the end of the study, participants be told about the true purpose of the research? So the answer for this one is D, debriefing. So switching gears a little bit, how do values affect psychological science? Even as scientists, uh, psychologists go into research and we all have different types of values that we're bringing into the studies that we're interested in. Uh, first and foremost, we're bringing our values into what we think we should be studying. Should we look at worker productivity? Should we look at sexual discrimination, gender differences? Should we study conformity or a multitude of other topics? What is it that we want to study is being influenced by our values as individual human beings. Something else to really consider is how do the purpose and labels affect psychological science? So when we decide on what we're gonna study, um, what is the purpose of it? Why are we studying it? And again, we're bringing our values into these things. Are we trying to inform people? Hopefully we're not really trying to persuade them because we want to remember the rat is always right. No matter what we come in with, our preconceived ideas, we have to take the information that we get from the study um, as the truth. Um, are we trying to enlighten people? How is the behavior labeled by the scientist? Did the participant react stubbornly, stubbornly or with resolve? The language that we use as scientists when we're writing up the results of our study have a really large influence on how it is perceived by other people. So we need to be really careful about using really strongly worded statements, either in a positive or negative direction. Um, saying something like, did this subject show fear or were they cautious? Um, those, kind of, those kind of words can actually change how people are interpreting your results. Okay, so let's look, let's review our learning targets for this very short module. Explain the process of determining which research design to use. So generate a testable hypothesis, it has to be testable, something that you can actually test for. Consider the best research design. Should it be something descriptive? Should it be correlational? Should it be experimental? Measure those variables and then interpret the results. Explain the value of simplified laboratory conditions in illuminating everyday life. Well, researchers want to create a controlled artificial environment so they can test general theoretical principles. These principles help explain everyday behavior. Explain why psychologists study animals and describe the ethical guidelines that safeguard them. Well, as humans, many of us have an interest in animal behavior and we wanna understand if there are processes shared between animals and humans. Um, the good news is that now government agencies have many standards of care and professional associations have many guidelines for protecting animals' well-beings. Describe the ethical guidelines that safeguard human research participants. Well, the APA ethics code uh, outlines standards for safeguarding human participants' well-being including obtaining their informed consent and debriefing them later. These are two really important concepts of those that we mentioned. Describe how values affect psychological science. Well, psychologists' values influence, first and foremost, what they decide they want to study, their choice of research topics. Their, our values influence our theories and observations, pretty much everything we're doing. We have to really be checking ourselves continually to make sure that our values aren't having an effect on the research that we're doing. 
Um, they can have, they can have, our values can affect our wording, our labels for behavior. Um, the application of psychology's principles have been used mainly in the service of humanity. So that's something we have to keep in mind that as psychologists, we are conducting research to be in the service of humanity, to hopefully be trying to make life better for humans and in many cases, animals as well. So that is it for this module. Thank you for listening. Take care.